Okay. There you go. How's that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to the beginning. Sorry, group. Um, so it looks like a very pleasant group that you have there of intelligent people. I'm glad for you. Yes. Professor Senna. I have to get used to calling you that because I know that you don't allow the students to call you by your first name, right? Um, yeah. I'm supposed to be working on um, uh, um, student uh, involvement or um, 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 so getting students involved in the class. So if anybody certainly wants to ask a question, please interrupt me. However, I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna move through quickly, okay? And we have time, Savannah? Yes. Professor Sen. We... Yes, you have up to an hour and a half. All right, let's go. We'll go. Okay. So I did a, you know, first I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you and then I'll tell it to you. Okay. So uh, I think we're going to do a little bit about seeds because we're talking about seeds versus cuttings. And um, both are really important in commercial uh, greenhouse business. Um, and then the big difference between the past and the present is the speed and volume at which things happen. So uh, I'll show you, I have a few videos and if they work properly, we'll see um, some, some transplanting machines and so forth, but they're very short videos. I'm gonna proceed now. So um, uh, the way that we used to sow seeds, can you see my arrow pointing at this? On the right-hand side is um, a row tray. So you would sow seeds in rows maybe quite compactly, and it wouldn't take up a lot of space, but then people would prick them out, so to speak, uh, a little bit at a time, and put them in, in uh, pull them out, and put these were very immature seedlings, they put them in the final container or uh, flat, which contained 32 or 48 seeds. So now we do this with transplanting machines and in plug flats. And so the transplanting machine on the left has P pneumatic, pneumatic, uh, needles that suction up the seeds which are vibrating in the seed tray and then one row at a time gets transplanted okay so the seed tray will move over after each row is transplanted um, the end result is something like this these are this is a greenhouse full of seed trays these have to be sold and planted on a timely basis so that they don't stretch and height control is an issue with things like this so here's a couple of women working in a greenhouse, got some seed trays, got to go out and transplant them, right? People have fun working in greenhouses, by the way. And I had a lot of fun for 22 years. I caused the university to purchase a um, vacuum seeder. I would recommend it for you when you get your little greenhouse going there, uh, Professor Sen, uh, to do a, get a vacuum seeder at the very least so that you can uh, have what they call singulation, one seed per hole in the plug trays. So then um, what the machines do now is they take the place of the transplanter, they grab the seedling and put it in the final container. In the garden centers, you're going to see annuals being sold in four inch pots now because they make more money doing that with three or four uh, impatience or begonias planted in a four inch pot. So this is a transplanting line at Jeremiah, Jeremiah Greenhouse. Uh, the, the seeds get picked up by um, fingers, so to speak, uh, out of the plug tray and transplanted into the flat. This is what it looks like when it's happening. Um, and then here is a little demonstration which I can activate of the machine in motion. So uh, they said, did you share anything when you came back from the Ohio short course? Well, I'm sharing it with you now, uh, Professor. Okay. Um, now, take a look at this, if we can get this going. This, the fastest, yeah, now you saw one row at a time being planted um, of the seeds with, a, with a, the vacuum needles, so to speak. This is a barrel seeder. This is the fastest Pay attention when we get to the latter part of this. It's only a couple of minutes long. And you'll see a barrel seeder um, and see how fast the seed tray moves through, moves through the system. So this is all the steps. I'll, I'll, I think there's no talking, so I'll talk over it. 
Did you know AAA uh, members get exclusive sorry. discounts and benefits when they rent a car with Hertz? Whether it's home for the holidays. Here we go. Full screen. So the trays get loaded mechanically after somebody loads a bunch of them in there. They're empty. You can hear me, right? Yes. Trays are getting loaded. Going through to the next step, they get, have soil in them now. Then they're probably being watered by that next machine. It's being they're being watered down. Now this is a dibbler. People used to do this by hand, and now it's going through the cedar. Now watch for the barrel. Now watch for the barrel up top. See it? See the seeds on the barrel? As fast as that plug tray moves through, it's being seeded, and that's a big advancement over going row by row. Then it comes out and it's covered with vermiculite and somebody has to take it off the conveyor and put it on a cart and bring it out to the greenhouse. I'll stop the video there in the interest of moving on to the next thing. So now I have to get out of this somehow. Okay. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh oh, I think that um, you're no longer sharing. So you could go back to share screen and then share the window that has your presentation again. Okay, give me a second. I got to get out of YouTube, is what I have to do. Uh oh. I'm still with you. Okay. Get the presentation back. Can you see that? We can't see anything yet. Okay. Can you see it now? Um, no, I think you have to confirm. You have to select the window and then confirm on the lower right. That looks good. That looks good. Okay, we move on to the next slide. So we're talking about, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. We're talking about seed sexual versus asexual propagation, seeds versus cuttings. With seeds, we have pollination. Outdoors, we have pollination by insects and wind. Then we have breeding, which I think you do teach a little bit. Deliberate selection of the pollen and seed parent. Um, and seeds of cultivated varieties or cultivars may not be true to type. People like to save the seeds from their oranges and plant them and say, gee, maybe I'll get the same thing. Probably not. Um, seeds of species are generally true to type. So up in the mountains where you have what they call a uh, climax community of, of, uh, of pine trees. They're probably all the same species and would probably be true to type. I'll just move on from there. Let's go on to the next slide. So, um, so uh, you know, remember Aileen Vaveritan? Remember her, Savannah? she did a nice presentation of the different types of asexual propagation. And so we have different things. We have a division of perennials where you take two forks. And I, I gave a class where I brought in two huge forks and I told someone to bring in perennials. And like, I'm ready to separate it with forks and you could just tear it apart by hand. Layering is where a branch tips down and touches the ground and you can help it do that with a, uh, with a plant like hydrangea, um, uh, scratch the bottom of the stem, maybe use a little rooting powder, bury it underground, weigh it down with a rock, let it root. Root cuttings, we did successfully on your campus with plumbago. Do you know what plumbago looks like? Anybody in the group? Blue flower. Yeah. Okay. And bulb increase methods, you know, bulbs tend to multiply themselves. And uh, I worked a lot with lilies. Lilies have scales that look a little bit like artichoke when you eat it, they peel off. And so each scale can be made into a new bulb. Uh, it, it will generate a new bulb when it's put in media. Um, and then I'll have some pictures here of leaf cuttings and leaf bud cuttings. 
Um, air layering, I've seen this done on your campus with um, people do it with a plastic bottle and they'll put it on a branch of uh, one of those yellow flowered uh, trees that are there in the, in the courtyard and, and uh, have um, sphagnum peat moss in there that's been moistened. Um, the, the branch has to be injured first. It has to have a slit put in it or three slits put in it. And it helps to jam the slits open with a toothpick or something. So that's air layering. And then grafting, I have a picture on the right here if I'm not blocking the picture um, of, uh, of, of a graft that we did with the class. And there's a man that will come and work with the class, uh, Professor Sen, that will work with the class to help do this. So that's like a apical wedge graft. Is, is your, is the, am I blocking the picture of the, of the plant there? go into presentation we can, yeah we can see most of it but a little bit of it's cut off so that would be great if you go in presentation thank you yeah that might be the next slide okay does that help so you can see the graph there right so that was like an apical wedge graft or there's another name for it micropropagation you you did or were doing in prop class with the uh, laminar flow hood the hood and with uh, Angelo as our primary student that got us going on that. And I remember paying for some of the media that came from one of those companies, right? Um, okay, so uh, this was a successful propagation by one of my students at New York Botanical Garden of a leaf cutting of begonia. Here, you know, the veins are a meristematic area, potential meristematic area. So if you sever along the veins, adhere it to the media, um, even we even had plantlets coming up where the uh, it's like a paper clip that we used to pin the leaf down, and so that created injury and that caused plantlets to come up. But this lady had her own heat mat at home, and she had a, her own hobby greenhouse, so she was the one person that succeeded with it. This is a typical cutting. When I think of rooted cuttings, this is what I think of: something that's uh, a couple of inches long. You want to have maybe two. Uh, whole leaves and some uh, immature leaves and the growing tip. Um, uh, in your notebooks, I know you're very good students, in your notebooks, please write down the four conditions for rooting cuttings. High humidity, bottom heat, rooting powder, and shade. Okay, two of these are to prevent the severed cutting from wilting, and two of them are to enhance or speed up rooting. So bottom heat, enhances or speeds up rooting. Rooting powder produces more roots per rooted cutting and faster rooting. Uh, on the right is probably a fuchsia cutting. And uh, we did a few of those. Sterile medium includes, you want to use sterile medium, uh, vermiculite perlite sand. Uh, some people that I know are very fond of rock wool. Uh, one of the big advantages of rock wool is that it has something like 70% airspace. So you're not gonna get a root disease problem that easily with that kind of airspace in there. Oasis is used for poinsettia cuttings. So, uh, also people direct stick into a four inch pot like geranium cuttings. It's called direct sticking, no intermediate step in a tray. Uh, the trays are frequently 72 uh, holes that cuttings are sold in. Uh, on the right is vermiculite, in the middle is perlite, on the left is um, peat, peat moss, and, and on the very left is a growing mix, which has to be very fine in order to sit, fit into plug trays. We have the term adventitious rooting. I used to think of adventitious as being kind of a fortunate accident, but what it really means is that it's occurring in the, in the place that's not the usual place. So roots tend to form root, more roots. There are, there's meristematic activity in the root zone. And so roots tend to form more roots and that's where we expect to see roots. Um, but when we see them on a stem or at a node, um, it's not the usual place. So in this kind of propagation and cutting propagation, we have something called wound induced meristematic activity. Um, and we distinguish between those roots which are preformed so you'll see at a node, sometimes you'll see some preformed roots or those that are wound induced. Uh, so oxen travels, this is endogenous oxen. We're talking about the, the, the oxen that's in the plant, travels from the apex from the growing tip down towards the base 
and accumulates at the wound site of a severed plant. So vegetative propagation maintains a clone that is identical in genotype to the single source plant. Clean stock plants are necessary to produce healthy cuttings. They should be free of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and other pathogenic organism. This is Dr. Hartman talking from beyond the grave. A cutting that is barely good enough is never good enough. Hartman and Kester is the textbook. Are you still using that, Professor Sen? You have to demute. <laughs> yes or no? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Are you still using Hartman and Kester? Yes, that's correct. So Dr. Hartman says propagation is the foundation on which production horticulture hinges. In commercial activity, marginal quality propagules delay product turnover and create cultural and quality problems throughout the production cycle. Types of cuttings, herbaceous cuttings, which is mostly what we work with in the trade. We have this whole series of things now called the Proven Winner Series. I'm gonna show you a video if we get to it. Softwood cuttings, and I, I'll be able to hold this up. I think you'll be able to see this. This is a rhododendron plant. They got sheared out there. So this is still a little bit green. Um, softwood cuttings, semi-hardwood cuttings, cuttings would be like have a slightly firmer stem. And in some cases they actually scrape the, stem with like a carrot peeler to, to um, expose some of the surface. This would be like more like a, so the softwood cuttings occur in the spring and then hardwood cuttings would be just basically a stick holding it up so you can see it. Uh, and then you cut the bottom on a diagonal so you know which side goes down. Um, so those can be harvested in bundles and stuck in sand and usually it's an outdoor production scheme. Uh, the tips of herbaceous material are, are, are commonly used in the greenhouse trade. Uh, endogenous auction travels from the apex to the base, interrupted by the wound itself. So we have these two terms. Now you're writing in your notebooks, endogenous and exogenous, right? So endogenous growth regulators are internal to the plant. There are five growth regulators that are in constant interaction, uh, sometimes anta an antagonistic interaction. And exogenous are the growth regulators that we apply from the outside. Um, so rooting powder is an example of that in horticulture. Um, okay, the water status of the cuttings you take is extremely important. So the stock plants get watered the night before. I probably have it on the next, on the next slide. Um, rather than the same day of, you're gonna take cuttings from a stock plant, you water them the night before so that they'll have good terger is the term. Let's see. Um, we did take successful cuttings, Professor Sen, in the class when I was doing it. And um, here's some examples of on the left, uh, a privet cutting and variegated pittosporum. I would wander around the courtyard of my apartment building and take the cuttings before I went to class and hoping nobody would see me at seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, uh, I have a couple more to show. Okay, St. Paulia. Can anybody in the audience tell me what St. Paulia is? That African violet. Right, Victoria, okay. And streptocarpus, do you have a handle on that? No. It's a long strappy leaf. I think it's in the Jesneria family also and shoots up uh, uh, little clusters of flowers. Sansevieria, anybody have a handle on that? Which one, Sansevieria? Sansevieria. Oh, that's Sansevieria. the snake plant, yeah. Yeah, mother-in-law's tongue is the other name, common name. And then uh, Jade is in the Crassulaceae family, Crassulaceae family and uh, Sedum is also mentioned as something uh, with just the leaf, just the leaf is only necessary to do the, uh, the cuttings. With streptocarpus, which is a long strappy leaf, you can cut it along the vein longitudinally and stick it in media. That's a fun one to do in class. And also you can, if you cut it the other way, and this is the same for mother-in-law's tongue, um, be aware of where the polarity is, uh, that, that the veins kind of point up like the letter V. Uh, this is a leaf cutting of begonia. Uh, this person just had dirty hands, Miss St. Clair, uh, uh, 
Professor Sen, this, this person just had dirty hands to start with. Their hands didn't get dirty doing this activity. <laughs> and uh, leaf bud cuttings, uh, camellia is an example of something where the, to have a bud as well as a leaf is required. And if the leaves are too much of a bother in this case, you can cut them. It's not the important part and they won't be valuable later on. So this works with camellia, magnolia. You could do it in the classroom with ficus elastica and you could also do with ficus elastica um, air layering, air layering, doing a branch wrapped in, um, uh, put, stuffed with sphagnum moss wrapped in plastic and moistened, but you have to wound it first. Types of growth, to, well, types of oxen uh, is uh, hormidin one, two, and three, number one, two, and three. Dip and grow, which is, uh, a different kind of oxen, naphthalene acetic acid, and that is a liquid. So you can, if you have to read the directions, you mix it up in three different strengths. The five growth regulators, which you will be able to say in your sleep, okay, after you're finished taking the class with me, is oxen, cytokinin, gibberellin, abscisic acid, and ethylene. Uh, there's a new one called brazinosteroids, which I thought, well, nobody's going to be talking about this or working with it. And it turns out they are. Uh, that Phytotech Labs, uh, Professor Sen that we worked with, is selling it. So um, three of the growth regulators have to do with growth promotion. And abscisic acid has to do with growth inhibition. Uh, seeds that set up dormancy to get through the winter are full of abscisic acid. And then it takes six weeks of chilling to overcome that, to erode the abscisic acid effect. And there's a corresponding rise in gibberellin. Soaking seeds in gibberellin can stimulate germination in many cases. There are four 60 page chapters on seeds in Hartman and Kester that I just read recently. Okay, we'll look. High humidity. So I'm going through, I think the four things that we mentioned. Um, Oxen, high humidity, shade, and bottom heat. So now we'll go through them one by one. So um, plant cuttings have no roots to accept moisture when you cut them. Uh, so they have to be put immediately in a humidity tent, which you can create with PVC and a big piece of plastic. A humidity dome, which is a plastic cover, vented or unvented. You can take sticks and put them over a four inch pot and drape a plastic bag over them and you can do a single cutting in there. And then we talk about intermittent mist, okay? So here's an example of intermittent mist, which revolutionized plant propagation. Uh, if a cutting takes a long time, like poinsettias, the mist can actually leach the nutrients out of the cutting in the three weeks that you're waiting for it to root. So two solutions. One is to put nutrients through the mist at a very low rate, like 50 parts per million or less. And the other is to incorporate um, uh, osmocote type slow release uh, fertilizer in the media so that when the roots do uh, come out of the cutting and go searching for nutrients, it will already be there. Because the, if you missed with uh, with fertilizer, it can create problems. It can create an algae layer, which promotes algae, uh, which promotes fungus gnats. Fungus gnats lay their eggs in the soil and, and the larvae cause root disease. They chew on the roots. So um, the type of intermittent mist that we used employed a solenoid valve and a timing device. Uh, and so the mist would go off for six seconds every three, six or 12 minutes. But it's the grower's responsibility to watch that because as the plants root, you wean them off the mist gradually. And on a rainy day, uh, you override it. You don't need it. And uh, at night, you don't need it at all. Problems in the greenhouse industry, right? Uh, botrytis, which is gray mold, powdery mildew, downy mildew. Uh, so the best cultural practice is to let the plants go into the night dry and uh, fungicides get dragged out of the cabinet to spray them if you have a big problem. Uh, you know, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. The first rule in horticulture, if you're a grower, is do no harm to your crop. You wanna bring your crop through from start to finish. So here's kind of a setup where there's uh, misting nozzles every three or four feet, 
a solenoid valve that lets the water in, and two clocks, one that's a 24 hour timer that shuts the mist off at night, and the other that tells it how many, how often it's gonna go on for six seconds. In that ground bed um, illustration or drawing there is snaked through it is a heating coil. And then there would probably be sand on top of that. It's kind of a sloppy way to do horticulture, but uh, so th this is a modern greenhouse. Uh, you know, the growers, the guys that do this for a living, kind of scrappy uh, guys that move fast and this is their whole life. Um, I used to have the high school kids say to me, this is your whole life, Mr. Creed, and this is not my whole life. You know, I have the prom this weekend or whatever. They couldn't work on Mother's Day because they had to be with their mother. Okay, so the benefits of intermittent mist. How are we doing on time? How, far, how much time has elapsed? 25 minutes have elapsed. Good, okay, we're doing good. So we talk about turgor, which is the cutting being basically not wilting or having good positive uh, fluid in it. Um, so the mist will reduce transpiration and it also, good or bad, cools the leaves by as much as 10 to 15. I wrote down the Fahrenheit here, nine to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. This can be good or bad. You have bottom heat underneath there too, which is one of the four ingredients. Foliar uptake of H2O is possible. Well, as long as foliar uptake of H2O is possible, so is foliar uptake of nutrients. Higher light intensity is okay. So in the Southern US where you guys are, it could be quite bright, but the cuttings under the mist system can take it. And you can also use a larger cutting, which makes for a stronger plantlet. Uh, because the spores get washed off, spores of botrytis, spores of powdery mildew get washed off with the mist, there is a decreased incident, incidence of disease if you play it right. Now, fog is a whole nother discussion. I have a whole presentation on fog, but um, the particle size is smaller. So 40 microns is, this goes in your notebook also, 40 microns is the dividing line between fog and mist. And most fog is much smaller than 40 microns, as little as five microns. So if you compared it with uh, a cup of water that's evaporating, uh, it would evaporate the same equivalent amount of, wa of water would evaporate 10,000 times faster, whatever. But the particles are so small that they don't rest on the leaves, which, we, which is what we call free moisture. So Botrytis cinerea is the second name, right? Is a disease organism that um, germinates at temperatures below 60, not a big problem for you in Southern California, in the presence of free moisture, uh, which means that moisture that's beating up on the plant. So my joke about free moisture is that you don't have to pay for it, right? Uh, bottom heat, we didn't do it yet? Okay. So bottom heat is the use of an electric or hot water system called Biotherm is the uh, brand name of one of them to create a constant root zone temperature between 70 and 80. And you know, recently we did some cuttings at the University of Connecticut and I said, they're not rooting. I said, why don't you turn it up closer to 80? And the woman thought that uh, 80 was very high, who works there, who's very lovely uh, and uh, really going into a second time working with her now. Uh, uh, we have a good working relationship. So I said, why don't we compromise and set it for 75 degrees? You know get them to root, but the mist will be cooling them so that you need the heat to be closer to 80 in some cases. So the bottom heat enhances or speeds up the rooting process. Uh, maybe you remember Professor Sen that we gave out hob hobby heating mats in a class uh, and somebody might've thought that was expensive and wasteful, but um, the students can be encouraged to buy one. Um, an electric mat may require a, device, a grounding device, um, not for a hobby mat, but I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, some growers will channel some hot air from a heat duct underneath a bench and then drape uh, plastic around the uh, bench as you would a long tablecloth and have the, a heat duct setting heat under the bench and generating bottom heat that way. In Southern California, household temperatures may be adequately high in order to root cuttings. Um, you don't stick cuttings direct, that you're rooting directly in a window. 
um, off to the side of a window is not a bad idea and possibly an east or west window rather than a south, southern one. So here's some different versions of bottom heat. Under bench heating in the top middle, in the bottom left, under floor heating before the concrete is floor poured in the bottom right image and under bench heating is uh, a common way to provide heat in large greenhouses. But in the Northern area where I am, there will be three types of heat in the same greenhouse, under floor, under bench, and in the air uh, through modine type heaters. So one kicks in when, when uh, in, like in the spring and the fall, maybe the floor heat is adequate and then maybe the under bench heat is adequate. And then the third source might be necessary on the coldest days. So here's uh, under bench, under uh, on top of bench heating on the left and uh, same thing on the right. This product is called AgriTape. So I used this over the time that I was running the greenhouse and we used it for rooting cuttings on a small scale and, and germinating seedlings. So uh, it has a grounding device, which is the bluish wire that goes onto a screen that goes down the full length of the thing. And there's four different separate AgriTapes that get plugged in separately to that device, which is a thermostat. And there's a copper thing that inserts into the soil and that's measuring the temperature of the soil, not the air. If it pops out and it's measuring, measuring the temperature of the air, then that's not accurate. Okay, rooting powder. By the way, Professor San, you bought a whole slew of this. The shelf life is like one year of rooting powder. So don't plan on, on saving it 10 years, but uh, a rooting powder contains auxin IBA. Uh, plants uh, produce some IBA, but it needs to be converted to IAA in order to be utilized. The brand name is Hormidin, number one, two, and three. So one is for herba herbaceous cuttings or soft cuttings that would freeze at 32 degrees, and two is for soft wood cuttings, which uh, I kind of showed you something that might be a soft wood cutting here. Hold it up again. That's kind of mid-season. Uh, no, soft would be would be early season. Just, just pushing out of the, of the plant in the spring. And then a little mid-season, you would have something a little sturdier and more lignified. Uh, there's cells called sclerid cells or uh, sclerenchyma cells, Professor Sen, right? That sounds right. And then hardwood cuttings uh, are, are grown commercially. Uh, so that's number three, you use number three. So they said, you know, uh, I think somebody who worked there said, Mr. Creedon does the same thing in every class. Well, there's three different strengths of rooting powder. So you can do three different kinds of cuttings. Plus there's dip and grow. And then there's different kinds of cuttings. So uh, we're on to shade, which is one of the four things. And this is also to avoid wilting. So the cuttings have been severed. They have no chance of uptake. Uh, so wilting has to be prevented. Uh, and they can't uptake any water on the new root system until it forms. So there's a need for a good turger of the, of the cuttings when you stick them and good water status of the stock plants before you take cuttings from them. So you could have a big geranium plant in the greenhouse that you take cuttings from or a big fuchsia plant that you take cuttings from. Uh, water the stock plants the night before we did that. Okay, so temperature, the need for shade in the propagation environment especially in Southern California would be key. Um, see the discussion about bottom heat versus heating the whole greenhouse. Okay, bottom heat is critical in most propagation situations. I would say this is true. With poinsettia cuttings, it's critical that you have bottom heat. So you only have about three weeks to root cuttings. And if they don't root in three weeks, they're gonna start to rot. Um, shade houses uh, down near, um, I think Keith was kind of urging them, are you gonna build another shade house? Um, down near Balboa Park, not the Balboa Park in Woodland Hills, but the Balboa Park in San Diego, they have a very nice, large, ornate shade house, which is worth walking through. But contemporary would be to just take a hoop house and cover it with saran, 60% shade or whatever, um, and that would act as the, the shade house. 
And then the garden centers, it's amazing how much money they're making just under shade outdoors uh, without any structural at all. What's the name of the garden center that I used to go to there in Woodland Hills, Professor? Um, it's Green Thumb. Green Thumb, yeah. Okay. Um, so the kind of containers, you could root things in open container. Um, in the old days, uh, Professor, there was, in addition to little old men that would steam soil for you, they used to create wooden boxes for planting things in, like in the winter in the downtime, they'd, they'd hammer together these little wooden boxes and then they would steam them to sterilize them. But everything's plastic now. So cell packs, jiffy cubes, peat pots, and direct stick into the final size pot. So we, we saw this slide already, but the sides of the size of the plug trays are routinely 288 cells, 384 cells, or something in the 300s. 512, the cells are so small that it has limited use. So a 512 is seldom used because it will, the seedlings will outgrow it too fast. Um, different size pots, I think we're gonna look at four inch, six inch, eight inch, 12 inch, et cetera. Hanging baskets are grown in 10 and 12 inch pots. So traditionally, a lot of flats of annuals are sold uh, in the trade. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see 804, which would be for begonias or impatience. Um, and then up above, there are six packs, but that's 72 cells up above there. And on the left, Jiffy 7s, which are flat until you soak them. I think we get to see an image of them soaked. Okay, in the middle, we see four inch pots, six inch pots, eight inch pots, a one gallon nursery, nursery can, and then there are five gallon nursery cans and clay pots with patina. So the wealthy ladies would come in and they liked the clay pots with the patina and the magazines tell you how to create it by painting mayonnaise on the pots or something like that. Okay, in the middle is a jiffy cube that's been kind of inflated with uh, water. So we received many geranium cuttings in the jiffy cubes. It's off awkward to moisten them after you've received them like that. We received many poinsettia cuttings in the oasis that you see on the left, those triangulated ones, and in the upper right. In the lower right, believe it or not, is Rockwell. It's, it's yellow. And um, we used that to grow lettuce that we did in a hydroponic system this past winter. So um, a little bit about sanitation. How much time do we have, Professor? Um, you have up to an hour left, I think. Well, 55 okay. minutes. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll uh, now am I interfering with something you're gonna do after this or not? No, that's fine. This is wonderful, okay. thank you. Okay, so always start with new or sterilized containers or pots, clean tools uh, and a clean bench top if you're working on a bench top. 10% Clorox is used as a sterilin or the product which is called Green Shield. Uh, ironically, I never had a problem with the volatiles of Clorox ruining a plant. Uh, if you spray Clorox directly on a plant, you'll hurt it. Um, and I'm not sure about Green Shield, but I sprayed Green Shield in a closed greenhouse near nighttime, spraying off a bench, clean, uh, sanitizing a bench. And there were some hanging baskets overhead of ivy geraniums, and they experienced phytotoxicity, plant damage, which uh, had not happened to me from a chemical before that. Uh, clean hands when you're approaching the potting table. The two dirtiest things that you can do is pull weeds on the floor underneath the benches and then go to the potting table, wipe off your blue jeans and go to the potting table. Also, we had hoses and multiple aisles to go down the hoses with. So I would say to one of my employees, I'll help you move the hose. You just start walking down the next aisle and I'll help you drag the hose. So now you're doing hand over hand, dragging the hose, helping them move it. And your hands are filthy. because So the two dirtiest things in the greenhouse are the bottom of your feet, and your hands after you've been dragging the hose for somebody. So then before you go to the potting table again, you wash your hands. Uh, organic debris promotes botrytis. Um, and if you don't know what botrytis looks like, call up a picture on your phone. Um, it's called gray mold 
And the Dutch word for it is, is um, fire because it spreads like fire in the greenhouse. Um, the worst time that we saw it is not when the crop is new and there's a few new flowers on, a, on some uh, impatience or New Guinea impatience. It's after they've been growing for a while and the first flowers fall off and they fall into the interior and there they are and you go through a damp night where it's been raining, but now it's summertime, so you don't have any heat on. And uh, so then you'd have an outbreak of botrytis, which you'd have to hand clean a lot of the plants um, or spray something. Clean bench tops, especially before new crops. So before you plant poinsettias in the fall, uh, it's a huge opportunity to clean off everything from the spring, get rid of all the dead leaves, sanitize the benches uh, by spraying them with a the Clorox solution uh, and killing the algae in the house and so forth. Remove the leaf litter from the greenhouse each night. So when we did the cut flowers, which we did like, I don't know, 600,000 to a million stems of, we would strip one third of the stem uh, and remove it so that it reduces the transpirational area and so forth. We wouldn't, um, they, would, they don't sit in the water. You don't have stem material sitting in the water. Anyway, that stuff, we'd have whole buckets full of it and we'd have to get rid of it every night rather than leave it sitting around. Okay, so now I want you, we've been talking about sanitation, have we? I want you to see a video. Now, in order for me to show this, I have to get back to my task bar. Is there a way for me to do that, Professor? If you just minimize the window, you should be able to open up anything else you want and you don't have to stop sharing. Um, you could just go to, you know, minimize your PowerPoint. So maybe press escape first. Do you have escape on the top left of your keyboard? There you go. Yeah, I'm now you can minimize your window and you can go wherever you need to go. Okay, let's see how this works. This is Pleasant View. This is about six minutes long, I think. Okay, and that, uh, that one's not showing for us. So you may have to stop sharing and reshare again. I might have been wrong about that. So go ahead and go to um, stop sharing and then go share screen again and select the window that has the Pleasant View video in it. See the video. Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, six minutes now. Keep this san video shows the procedure at Pleasant View Gardens for rooting vegetative. Keep sanitation in mind as we view this. Uh, how, see how clean they keep everything. Okay. Cuttings. It is an overview of the entire process used for training purposes and for identifying key focus areas for in-depth training. When the cuttings arrive, they're unpacked as soon as possible in a clean area. The labels and invoices are checked to ensure that the shipment is correct. Shipping errors are reported immediately. The boxes of cuttings are organized according to species. They are then loaded onto carts in the order of their sticking priority. Cutting quality is checked before sticking or storage. We look for disease, fungus, virus, and shipping damage. Any problems with cutting quality are reported immediately. Highest priority cuttings are prepared for planting first. The rest wait in the cooler on carts at 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit until they can be planted. The goal is to plant all cuttings on the same day that they arrive. However, they can be held overnight in the cooler if necessary. Before carts with cuttings are brought into the sticking area, the floors and equipment surfaces must be clean, free of soil, and disinfected with Green Shield solution. The cuttings, the planting materials, the schedules, soil, and equipment are organized, set up, and prepared prior to planting. Preparations also take into consideration how plants will need to be grouped and treated once in the greenhouse. The process then moves to the beginning of the conveyor line. The stack of trays used for the crops being planted are loaded into the tray separator and individual trays are automatically placed on the conveyor. The tray is filled with soil and watered in as it moves along the conveyor belt. The soil in the tray should be moist but not dripping wet. An automatic dibble press creates holes in the soil where the cuttings will be placed before the trays move into the planting area. Electronic eyes are used to automate each process and must be kept clean and properly aligned for the entire system to function. 
The conveyor moves the dibbled trays into the planting area, and workers are seated at stations next to the conveyor belt. Each worker has a workbench, soap dispenser, spray bottle of green shield, gloves, apron, paper towels, and a signal switch. Supervisors provide workers with cuttings and sticker labels. If there are no labels or not enough labels, the cuttings are not planted until the problem is corrected. Employees are required to wear both gloves and aprons and follow sanitation protocols. Workers are instructed not to share cuttings in order to avoid spreading plant diseases and can report to supervisors if they need additional supplies, plants, or labels. The workers inspect the cuttings as they plant and report disease and quality issues. They must also check that the trays are filled adequately and that the dibbled holes are aligned properly before sticking the cuttings. The employees turn the signal switches when they need a new tray of soil. Using more electronic eyes, trays are moved and mechanically pushed into the worker's personal workspace, where they are easily brought down onto the workbench. There are three barcoded labels that the worker must stick onto the side of the tray. The center label has the crop name and information. The right label is used to trace the cuttings back to the supply farm. And the left label contains the worker's identification information. These labels can be scanned at any point in production. Once the labels are stuck, the worker disinfects their gloves with the green shield spray bottle and proceeds to stick cuttings. Planting styles differ and experienced workers may stick with two hands. Workers must plant cuttings efficiently, but also take care not to break or damage cuttings in the process. Some cutting bases are dipped in rooting hormone before planting and some varieties are planted two cuttings per cell. If plants have a wide base, workers may have to manually enlarge the dippled hole before sticking. The finished trays are pushed onto the second, lower conveyor that takes them further down the line. The worker wipes the workbench clean and disinfects it with green shield before signaling for another tray. As the trays leave the planting area, they're automatically misted so that they remain hydrated. Here, they reach the end of the conveyor line and are loaded onto metal carts. The crop information barcodes are systematically scanned into the PICUS inventory software. The software records the crops planted, tray sizes, batch sizes, and greenhouse locations. Also, the software records which worker planted each tray and can calculate how many trays per hour each employee can plant. After the carts are scanned, they are taken into the greenhouse to be set down. The crops are organized and grouped into locations depending on family, water, fertilizer, and chemical requirements. The trays are set on the floors lengthwise in rows of six outwards from the centers of the greenhouse bays. The tray labels face out to the walkways so that the crops can easily be identified and scanned. The last task is to thoroughly clean the planting and preparation rooms. Soil and debris are swept from the floors and off of equipment, and the room is disinfected again with the green shield solution. The manufacturing portion of producing liners is finished, and the crops are. I just want to point out at this point that there's a boom overhead in the greenhouse, and that's how they're going to get misted or watered. Uh, it's on a flood floor, but they may or may not be using the flood floor. Now in the hands of the growers. Okay, so I'm going to reduce the size of that. Maybe get out of it. We're back in our video. That's good. That's convenient. Okay, so now seem to be talking a little bit about weeds. Weeds harbor insects which spread virus. So the two vectors of virus are Western flower thrips which came from your part of the country over here, and, uh, and aphids primarily. Weed control is thought to be essential in and around greenhouses. The greenhouse you just saw had concrete floors. It's less of a problem. Uh, using sterilized mixes, though, for seedlings for new plants is uh, part of avoiding weeds. Um, etiolation as an advanced topic. This is what I did my thesis type to topic, my project on before I graduated. Um, so we've been talking about cuttings 
uh, and you saw cuttings being transplanted manually at Pleasant View. Now I'm gonna show you a short video, very short of all of the transplanting being done by machine. However, a great deal of manual work has been done offshore before they ever received the cuttings. It's geraniums that you're gonna see being propagated here. This is a short one. Oh, we've got ads, hold on. Excited to introduce an automated transplant solution developed by Ball and Visser for the North American market and selected countries to mechanize the sticking of unrooted cuttings. This machine has one operator and needs two workers to load and unload the destination trays, the same as any sticking line. Loading and unloading of the trays in the future can be fully automated. are harvested and stuck into biodegradable strips offshore with 100% accurate cutting counts and high uniformity. This builds quality control into the cutting process. There's no intermediate step between receiving the product and transplanting. It's out of the shipping box and directly into the machine. In this process, the machine transplants the single strip module into the media. It consistently transplants to the pre-programmed depth using a pre-dibbler and works even in more compacted media. An installed blower ensures leaves from a previously transplanted cutting do not get in the way. Each strip is delivered with an attached farm label and the machine will transplant the label automatically with the cutting to ensure accuracy and traceability. machine can transplant continuously up to 11,000 cuttings per hour into different trays or pot configurations. Larger cuttings like geraniums and poinsettias will be delivered in a 34 module strip and smaller cuttings in a 51 module strip. About 90% of our vegetative bedding plants can be transplanted by this very universal system. It's also designed to handle small runs. During this process, the machine can be preloaded with the next variety to avoid lag time. The base of each cutting is stuck to the same depth, driving uniform root initiation and development. Extensive trials have shown there are no rooting delays or any interference with crop time. Watch for live demonstrations at our upcoming open house events. For more information, You can get back, get back where we were. Okay, good. So we're getting near the end. Are there any questions at this point? I have a question about Botrytis. Age old question. I was wondering, um, is is botrytis and like other things like that? Are they just present in the atmosphere, and that and then like when the conditions are right, then they um, are able to propagate? Is that how that works? I think that's very safe to say that the spores are kind of omnipresent, but the conditions which promote them need to be there. Um, the same is true for a lot of the insects. You know. Uh, there was, uh, you know, who David Attenborough is on uh, Nature Shows. You're familiar. Yeah. With? Yeah. He went up in a, in a in a hot air balloon to like ten thousand feet. He had to. It was, he was up so high he had to use an oxygen mask. And he decided, well, as long as we're up here in in a hot air balloon, let's throw a net outside and see what we catch in the net. And so they had insects, tiny little insects in the net, but they were frozen. So they get the balloon down to like six thousand feet or five thousand feet, and the insects thaw out and start moving around. And guess what kind of insects they were? Aphids and mites. So 
they're kind of omnipresent, but you need the conditions. And, you know, there's things that we do to kind of seal off the greenhouse to prevent insects. Uh, but uh, you're lucky that in Southern California, it's so dry that you have fewer insects and you have fewer um, disease problems, especially outdoors. They say the reason things grow so well is that it's so dry because there's fewer disease problems. But um, the answer is yes, botrytis is kind of ever present. And if you have a bunch of rotting leaves around, it's, it, I mean, it's actually a beneficial organism in terms of breaking down leaf litter. In, in some ways it's beneficial to grapes at times. It helps promote uh, uh, ripening of cer certain types of grapes, but it's not always a good thing. Um, and apparently there are many different uh, variants of Botrytis. And there's even one that grows on Benlate, which is a uh, uh, one of the curative chemicals. Uh, does that answer your question adequately? Totally. Thank you very much. Anybody else? We're we have just a few slides to go through, and I think I did most of the video material. John Dolan, do you have a question? Oh, no, sorry. Let's see who else is there. Jesse, Mika, Ju Julian Ford, do you have a question? I had a question about um, the rooting powder expiring since we have rooting powder that's probably as old as I am and it seems to work, but that is probably just my good luck. Why does it expire? Um, the auxin is supposed to have, IBA is supposed to have a fairly short vase life uh, or uh, vase life, I'm used to saying vase life, shelf life. And so, um, it's probably not good to buy a whole bunch of it. When I was doing classes, I would go and buy new bottles in the in uh, Home Depot every time I had to teach. Uh, Bonide is one of the brand names that's there. Uh, but um, I mean, it's, it's it's like anything else. You could try it and see how it works. Um, and and you know, like it's like some of our uh, medications are supposed to expire after a year, but they still seem to work. You know, so right. That's why I was just wondering, like, what's the breakdown rate of it? Because we, where I work at my nursery, we sell Bonide branded rooting hormone, but it doesn't move very fast. And now I'm wondering if we should like toss what's on the shelf. Does it break down when it's opened? Does it break down when it's contaminated by your leaf yeah, or something? I would, I would think a sealed container would last longer. Refrigeration okay. may or may not help. Um, I would double check Hartman and Kester and see what they say, but I do remember more than once hearing that the shelf life of oxen is fairly short. All right, great. I'll take a look. Thank you. It's probably like pre-COVID bottles. Jocelyn, any questions? I had a question, uh, John. Uh, does the powders would that work for like uh i know that we use it for like propagation and stuff but would it work like if you're let's say transplanting a, a tree that's a, you know maybe a little more mature um, would that help it at all or is that only for like a prop you know cuts small cuts so with trees you would be do if you took a cutting of a tree you would cutting um, for every plant, there is a preferred method of propagation. And so, um, so, so for, for trees, it might be from uh, seed or it might be from uh, a, a grafted uh, plant. So uh, fruit trees are an example of that. They're very seldom on their own roots because the roots, uh, the, uh, the roots are, might be subject to disease or nematodes. So you might have a, a resistant rootstock that something gets grafted onto that is resistant to nematodes, disease, or dwarfing. It causes dwarfing. Uh, so uh, trees, uh, I have made cuttings from trees. I made cuttings from the most difficult to root trees, like oak, tre oak trees. That was what my, uh, what my uh, research was on. And we use this technique called etiolation, which is an advanced topic. But... Um, I, if you do take cuttings of trees, um, it may be that the early spring growth or the new growth in the spring is what you would take it from. 
Uh, but but I, I, there's a, a manual. There's a manual of woody plant propagation, uh, and there's also uh, yeah, I think a manual like it's a, like a historic test, like the manual of woody plant propagation or seeds of woody plants, uh, telling you what's necessary to get the seeds going. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Erwin, Mika. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Victoria. I just like talking about botrytis. Well, botrytis is, uh, it's no, it's no fun when you get it. Um, all right. Let me see if there's, there's, um, a couple more slides. How did we do on timing? Professor St. Clair. Sen. We're doing well. I just spilled my coffee. So I got to clean that up. Just go ahead. Thank okay. you. <laughs> So uh, some things, uh, golden pothos is a hanging basket where you may see internodal uh, uh, sections that have aerial roots present. So sometimes you'll see aerial roots. You know, I used to train things into trees. I trained coleus into these uh, topiaries, which is interesting because coleus has a square stem. And this, the branches would start to get very heavy. They're not designed to take that much weight. And just before they were about to break off, they'd form these nubs, like, like um, you know, like they needed to, like a person needs to shave. They'd form these nubs, nubs, nubs of root nodules. And it was as if the branch knows it's going to fall off and it, and it, it knows that it's gonna to have to root or get, be fortunate enough to land in moist soil. Um, uh, we talked about, showed pictures of Rex begonia leaf cuttings where you sever along the vein because that is a, meristematic area and, and press the cuttings down. And then bryophyllum, here's the picture of bryophyllum, by the way, where uh, the leaf margins are thought to be a photosynthetic area. Uh, no, I'm sorry, a uh, meristematic area. So these little plantlets, and you'll see roots on them also, um, are ready to break off. You, sometimes in nature, you'll see something forming another plant on the, on the margins. And then piggyback plant, Ptolemaea, is another one that's a good propagation subject. Um, let's see, here's some of the verbiage. Parenchyma cells. So um, your textbook has some explanations about uh, meristematic areas or new new root initials forming in the in the. It shows a cross section. 